Hi everyone, um, Derived Energy here. Today I will be talking about the Doomsday Argument. And uh, I learnt about this, this argument um, by reading on Amazon um, books The End of the World, Science and Ethics of Human Extinction written by John Leslie. And if, if you go to Amazon and type in the name of that book you can look inside and read many pages of the book which is great because it means uh, it's free um, so I'm going to read um, from from some relevant parts of this book to to in order to introduce you to the doomsday argument and um, and address some some rebuttals of this argument and it's a fascinating argument actually and uh, it's a it's an argument that actually I I, I, I thought about independently, um, but but let's 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 get into the into the book here. So let's see. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read from the the first pages now. Will the human race become extinct fairly shortly? Have the dangers been underestimated? The introduction the introduction will give the book's main arguments, particularly a doomsday argument originated by the cosmologist Brandon Carter. We ought to have some reluctance to believe that we are very exceptionally early, for instance in the earliest 0.001% among all humans who will ever have lived. This would be some reason for thinking that humankind will not survive for many more centuries let alone colonize the galaxy. Taken just by itself, the doomsday argument could do little to tell us how long humankind will survive. What it might indicate, though, is that the likelihood of doom soon is greater than we would otherwise think. Here, otherwise thinking involves taking account of well-recognized dangers like those of pollution and killer war. There are many other hazards which are seldom considered, for example the risk that physicists of the future e experimenting at immensely high energies will upset a space-filling scalar field and destroy the world, a possibility taken seriously by some leading theorists. There are even r risks coming from philosophical arguments which I've presented. Um, there is the following argument, for example, that any possible humans of the future couldn't be missing any benefits if they were never in fact born because you have to be born before you can really miss things which is pretty much um, David Benatar's argument and this book was written in um, 1997 and Benatar's book was written in 2006 um, okay Carter's doomsday argument this is where it gets interesting imagine a scene from the 21st from the late 23rd century, 12 billion humans walk the earth, but all are about to die. It might be through loss of the ozone layer, or poisoning by pollution or nuclear war, but let us instead say that it is through germ warfare. The fatal virus has a long latency period in which it produced no symptoms so that it is spread everywhere without being detected. The aggressor nation's vaccines to protect itself have failed. One of the doomed human's complaints of, this, of his remarkable bad luck in being born so late. There have been upward of 15,000 generations since the start of human history, yet here I am, in the one and only generation which will have no successors. Isn't there an absurdity in his reasoning? If doom were to strike in late 2090 AD, in about 2090 AD, then because of population growth, perhaps a tenth of all humans who had ever lived would still be alive when it struck. Well, there can be nothing very remarkable in living at a time occupied by about one in ten humans. Now consider the doomsday argument. Suppose that many thousand intelligent races, all of about the same size, had been more or less bound to, in to evolve in our universe. We couldn't at all expect to be in the very earliest, could we? Very similarly, it, could, it, it can seem you and I couldn't at all expect to find ourselves among the very first of many hundred billion humans, 
or of the many trillions in a human race which colonized its galaxy. We couldn't at all expect to be in the first 0.1%, let alone the first 0.001% of all humans who would ever have observed their positions in time. While technological advances encourage huge population explosions, they also bring new risks of sudden population collapse through nuclear war, industrial pollution, etc. If the human race came to an end soon after learning a little physics and chemistry, what would be, what would be remarkable in that? Suppose we were extremely confident that humans will have a long future. You and I uh, would then simply have to accept that we were exceptionally early among all humans who would ever have been born. But mightn't it make more sense to think of ourselves as living at the same time as, say, 10% of all humans? And shouldn't this consideration magnify any fears we had for humanity's future, making our risk estimates rather more pessimistic? The Doomsday Argument aims to show that we ought to feel some reluctance to accept any theory which made us very exceptionally early among all humans who would ever have been born. The sheer fact that such a theory made us very exceptionally early would at least strengthen any reason we had for rejecting it. Just how much would it strengthen them? The answer would depend on just how strong the competing reasons were. The reasons for thinking that the human race would survive for many more centuries, perhaps colonizing the whole of the galaxy. The competition between reasons might even be modelled mathematically, and in fact the first the doomsday argument first appeared in about nineteen eighty in the mind of the Cambridge cosmologist Brandon Carter, um, elected a fellow of the Royal Society in recognition of his research in applied mathematics. What we must bear in mind is that Carter's doomsday argument doesn't generate any risk estimate just by itself. It is an argument for revising the estimates which we generate when we consider possible dangers. Okay. People have suggested many reasons for distrusting the doomsday argument. At least a dozen times I too dreamed up what seemed a crushing refutation of it. Be suspicious of such refutations no matter how proud you may be of them. Probability theory is full of traps. Don't put complete trust in the first, first blindingly obvious objection that springs to mind. The doomsday argument has now been thought about rather hard by some rather good brains. What seems to have, emer have emerged is that it doesn't fall victim to any simple counter-argument. Look at one very common criticism. Any people of a heavily populated far future are not alive yet. Hence we certainly cannot find ourselves among them in the way that we could find ourselves in some heavily populated city rather than in a tiny village. We are considering the doomsday argument now which means at around AD 2000. We know we are at around AD 2000. We'd be just as sure of it no matter what our theory was about how many humans would exist later. It's because we live near the year 2000 that we can say that the human race got as far as this safely but cannot say how much further it will get. The evidence we possess of the risks facing humankind is evidence from around 2000 AD, not evidence collected many thousands, thousands of years later. Well, these remarks are all of them correct, yet how could they invalidate the doomsday argument? Brandon Carter doesn't doubt that the neighbourhood of AD 2000 is now, that he really is in that neighbourhood with 100% probability. What he asks himself is the following, as a human observer, how likely would one have been to find oneself there if the lives of all but a very small proportion of all humans were to be lived later? 
Of course the lives of you and me are not particularly early among those of all humans alive now, let alone among the among those of all humans born. Oops. So sorry. Of course the lives in you and me are not particularly early among those of all humans alive now, let alone among those of all humans born so far. But to keep on to keep insisting on this is to miss Carter's point. The uselessness of protesting that later humans aren't alive yet can be shown it seems with a simple story. Imagine an experiment planned as follows. At some point in time, three humans would each be given an emerald. Several centuries afterwards, when a completely different set of humans was alive, 5,000 humans would again each be given an emerald. Imagine next that you have yourself been given an emerald in the experiment. You have no knowledge, however, of whether your century is the earlier century in, wh in which just three people were to be in this situation, or the latter century in which 5,000 were to be in it. Do you say to yourself that if yours were the earlier century, then the 5,000 people wouldn't be alive yet, and that therefore you'd have no chance of being among them? On this basis, do you conclude that you might just as well bet that you lived in the earlier century? Suppose you in fact bet betted, betted that you lived there. If every emerald getter in the experiment betted in this way, there would be 5,000 losers and only 3 winners. The sensible bet, therefore, is that yours is instead the latter century of the two. What if you were somewhat unsure whether the experimental plan called for more people to get emeralds in the latter century than, than in the earlier? Getting an emerald would now give somewhat weaker grounds for betting that you lived in the latter century. If you next came to know that you were, in fact, in the earlier century, then your new knowledge would strengthen your reasons for doubting that many more emeralds, or any, would be distributed in the later century. Throughout, it would of course be true that people who hadn't yet been born weren't yet observing anything, but this truth would be utterly irrelevant. Um, and there are some further examples of attempted refutations. The doomsday argument itself is reasonably straightforward. We should tend to distrust any theory w which made us into very exceptionally early humans. This is hardly a very difficult thought, is it? What can make the argument seem highly complicated is the need to guard it against a hundred criticisms. Still, many people like to learn straight away how their own blindingly obvious objections could possibly be faulted. Here then is a quick introduction to various common objections and to how we might reply to them. A. Don't object that your genes must surely be of a sort found only near the year 2000, and that in consequence you could exist only thereabouts. For what Carter is asking is how likely a human observer would be to find himself or herself near the year 2000, and hence with genes typical of that period. In the story about the emeralds, suppose that the genes of the earlier century were markedly different from the genes of the latter century. The story would retain all of its force, wouldn't it? You'd have fairly strong reasons for suspecting that your genes were once typical of the century with the 5,000 emeralds. Don't protest that the chances that at exactly such and such a date, exactly you, would be born couldn't have been raised or lowered by any facts about how many other people would be born convinced of it even after your name has appeared among the first three drawn from the urn. Still you would be somewhat less convinced than you were before. D. Don't object that any Stone Age man, if using Carter's reasoning, would have been led to the erroneous conclusion that the human race would end shortly. One answer to this objection is that Stone Age men weren't facing a pollution crisis brought on by a population explosion. Another is that it wouldn't be a defect in probabilistic, probabilistic reasoning 
if it encouraged an erroneous conclusion in the mind of somebody who chanced to be improbably situated somebody for instance who was in the earliest 1% or 0.01% or 0.0001% of all humans who would have ever been born does the doomsday argument fail because it could be used at a point in human history and at more po most points it would in indeed fail? One thing to bear in mind is that reasoning which failed for people at most points in human history by suggesting wrong predictions to them might still suggest a correct prediction to most humans who could use it if human numbers expanded rapidly soon before humankind became extinct. Remember though that the doomsday argument is merely an argument for revising risk estimates upwards. It might never indicate anything so strong as that doom soon was likely. Consequently, the fact that no disaster has yet occurred over all the years since the Stone Age ca cannot by itself establish that the argument's reasoning has, in ever, has ever in any sense failed. E. Don't object that if the universe contained two human races, the one immensely long-lasting and galaxy colonizing, and the other short-lasting, and if these had exactly the same population figures, say until 2000, 2150 AD, then finding yourself around 2000 AD could give you no clue as to which human race you were in. The answer to such an objection is that, in this bizarre scenario, a human could greatly expect, expect to be after 2150 AD in the long-lasting race, which you and I aren't. F. Don't object that there would be more chances of being born into a long-lasting human relate, race and that, there would and that these would precisely compensate for the lesser chance of being born early in the history of that race. The answer to this is that there would be nothing automatically improbable in being in a short-lasting human race. Okay, that's where I'm going to uh, finish reading it there. Uh, interesting thoughts, I think.